Next up, we have Adit Levine. Adit is the co-founder and CEO of Solo.io. She's going to talk about us, to, to us about New Horizons for Generative AI and GraphQL. Please welcome Adit. Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here today. And thank you, Kit, for an amazing uh, job here. Uh, so as Kit said, my name is Edith Levine. I'm the founder and the CEO of Solo. I was working a lot on the network space and actually a little bit more lower on the stack than you guys probably are. But we also have a GraphQL product and we're extremely excited about that space. So in that talk, I'm going to talk about two subjects. One of them is GraphQL, of course, we are here in the conference. And the other one is AI. Now, when you're talking about those two subjects, usually when I'm starting a talk, I like to kind of like level set everybody. What is those components that I'm going to talk about? So let's start with GraphQL. Now, I can start with GraphQL history, but honestly, you're here. You know that. You're the one who created that history. It's kind of like it will be a little bit of a waste of time. And we are here, actually, in the first conference, a vendor um, neutral conference. And that's so exciting because honestly, this community together is going to take that space so much faster forward if we will collaborate. So I'm very excited about that. And again, you are here not to hear about the history. And I also think that you had an amazing talk yesterday by Matt that basically share all that history, how we came to where we are right now. But you're here in that conference, so what's going to go forward. And there was amazing announcement here. That's true. But I want to take us a little bit more to the future, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about AI. In order to understand the history of AI, you need to remember that this is not a new space, right? I mean, even though it's getting a lot of attention right now, it's actually something that was there quite a long time ago, right? The human always wanted to make sure that the machine can help them be more lazy, right? So um, we are not going to cover about all of those history, but we are going to, to talk about some breakthrough in that space that happened in 2012. So in 2012, there was a competition called ImageNet Challenge. And the three people from the Toronto University decided to basically send their, their paper to that competition. And what they did, it's basically something very simple. They went to the local office depot, or the equivalent in Canada, basically bought some GPUs. They took this and they basically wanted to bring back the, 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 all that space to focus on con uh, CNN, which is basically conferential network, a, a neural network. They, that was kind of like thing that people start, stop kind of like researching because they didn't believe that it can be meaningful. It was kind of like stuck. So they decided to buy those GPU, build a network with this GPU and basically train. Right? And they did very, very well. And therefore, they won that challenge. So that's Alex, who is again the, fo the founder. It's called AlexNet. The Ilya, who was a, basically a PhD student in the same lab. And the PI, uh, Greg Furry. Once that release, honestly, it created quite a lot of noise. Everybody wanted to, they, those guys become very, very popular. Everybody wanted to try that. It was a real, real big breakthrough in the system. And like every smart people, <laughs> when you're becoming famous, you're opening a startup. You make a lot of money. And that's exactly what they did. They basically created a company called BNN Research. And it took that six months to get acquired by Google. And they basically started Google Brain. The question, why did they do that? Because it's very simple. If you're looking at Google and Facebook, those company by then was basically, um, on that time, one of the things that the most important to them was to suggest for the people, you know, uh, ads and, and kind of like give a lot of recommendation for buying stuff. All of these things we've done manually. That's very, very expensive. AI can actually save them tons of money, and that's exactly what they did. So basically, they created kind of like a dual monopoly. Monopoly. There were two companies. Every AI expert basically was in those companies, which scare a hell of the valley. Specifically, those two people, right? And the last, who you know all, it was very, very funny for the, 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 the dual monopoly that the, those companies created. And Sam, who was basically the leader of the white company. So those two people basically joined together and said, 
What can we do in order to fix and break that monopoly before it will be too late? And what they came with is they basically created an event and invited every people that is an AI expert from Google and from Facebook and asked them, what do we need to do in order to convince you to come with us and join us and start a startup? And what do you think the answer was? Nothing. We will never do that. We're working in Google, we're getting a bunch of money, working with very, very smart people, being treated well. We're not going to leave. There is no reason for us to start those AI. Everyone but one person. So Ilya. Ilya is actually a Russian born. He basically has a, a raised in a, in a Russia until age of five. At age of five, he went to Israel, was spending time in Israel, went to the university, started there, and then his family is basically um, uh, move, uh, immigrate to Canada. And he had the startup nation bug. Startup is actually something that Israel really, really like. That's how we train. That's how they're teaching us. Uri is here, I'm here, Lotan is here. That's what we're doing. And therefore, he basically decided to take the chance. And he left Google Brain and started a company called OpenAI. And together they started. Now, Elon Musk was a very, very big contributor. He basically bought a lot of money. And it's expensive, right? Running you know, a neural network in all those GPUs is extremely expensive thing. So you need money, and you need a lot of money. At one point, Elon decided that they're not making enough improvement, and they're not moving. He doesn't see a result. And he decided to basically take over the company. Sam didn't like that. Fight started. And what basically happened is that Elon decided to leave the company. That means that this is fine, right? They have everything they need besides one thing, which is money. You know, that's very expensive to actually train system. And this is why they decided to partner with Microsoft and basically cooperate. They had no choice. They needed the money in order to make an impact. And that's exactly what they did. And you probably all know that they announced Chat EPT, who basically changing the world right now. So that's basically the history of how we got to right now. And once Chat EPT is actually being announced, a lot of people understand how powerful and what we can do with this and how it can help us in every area and change our life. So let's talk right now a little bit about what is exactly, right? I talk about the history, what is exactly? So let's talk a little bit about math. Maybe not, too complex. So let's go look at trying to simplify that. What is really? We're talking about, and again, I'm dumbing it down like crazy, right? So <laughs> sorry for the people actually doing it. Okay, so let's assume that you have a function, right? You have one plus x equal three. It's simple equation. Let's assume that I'm giving you that x is equal to. It's pretty simple. The function is one plus x. Therefore, you have x equal to. The function result will be three, right? It's very simple. So you have an input of two to that function. And the output will be three. That's great. So if I'm giving you, if we're thinking right now about input and output, and I'm starting to basically giving you an input and output, and I'm giving you enough of those, you can probably guess what will be the next one, right? Because you see that pattern. And that's exactly what we basically machine learning is. So giving a bunch of, you know, uh, a input and output, you can actually, instead of solving for the result, for the output, you're solving for the function. And that's basically what it is, right? So again, this is very, very high, high level. But that's basically, every time that we're thinking about it, that's just the way we need to think about it. There is a three-way to train system. One of them is getting an input. It's what's called a supervised learning. I need to figure out if it's a dog or a hot dog. This is a dog. This is a dog. This is a dog. This is a hot dog. This is a dog, right? Very, very simple. The other one is unsupervised learning. I'm giving you a bunch of pictures, and you're basically sorting them. It's not tagged, so you don't really know. You can tag it later, right? But if you think about this, this is how the images of your phone is working. And the third one is everything that's called reinforcement learning, which is basically, you know, you're getting some feedback for the, for the environment and fixing, right? So again, when we're thinking about AI, we need to think always about an input and an output. So let's figure out right now what we're doing in graph here. I don't have a lot of time, so I will run. The first one, and it's something that, you know, we're always talking in our community. How do you start? Are you going schema first, code first? What if we don't have to go with both? What if we can actually go with natural language first? 
And basically, and there is already a project doing it in the future, in, in, the, in the ecosystem. What if what we can do is just basically text what we want to do, and that will create our RIS schema. So how is that going to work? It's pretty simple, right? I mean, we have chat GPT. Honestly, we can leverage that. It's not very hard. It basically can, um, you know, uh, we're providing a text and, you know, very lang natural language, and that's basically going to create, you know, a schema for us. Relatively simple. Why do we want to do that? It's just honestly easy. All we're doing right now in this ecosystem, and we talked about how we can make that easier to use, this is as easy as it's get, basically, right? Uh, in terms of obstacle, you know, there's always obstacle when you're talking about AI. First of all, you know, uh, uh, in terms of a, of a, of a, a resilience, and it's not really understanding what it's doing, right? It's, there's no really an understanding here. And, uh, and the, the other one is everything that we let at this day. We need the user to help us fix that. And as I said, people are already working on this. You can go. There's some open source project that's doing it. So in that case, right, what are we basically doing? Our input is a natural language query. And the output is a schema. Okay, that's very basic, very boring. So let's put it aside and move to stuff that are more interesting. And that's the gateway. So if something I pick up for this conference and where we are coming from, because that's the only thing that we are focused on, is basically got your gateway. So there was quite an evolution in this market, right? I mean, we started with schema stitching. There wasn't a great solution. Then we basically have Apollo announced federation. That was interesting, but there is some a, some a drawback specifically related to the fact that you need to still understand. It's not really a, you know, autonomy for the team. They still need to understand the big picture. Uh, the stitch did a, the guild did a great job, but basically improved the scheme of stitching. Apollo fight again, came with Federation 2.0, and now as a community, we're trying to basically come with a spec. What if we don't need all of this? What we need is AI. So let me explain you what I mean. Usually, when you have two subgraph, very simple, or well, not so simple, but can be simple enough to basically decide what is that supergraph. But this is more realistic situation, right? If you're thinking about the Netflix of the world, there's quite a lot of subgraph. Actually merging them and understand the big picture and extending, that's pretty hard thing to do. Can we not do that? Can we actually create this thing by basically training them with all that subgraph and basically the result of the super graph and let the system do that for us? We can. So again, how we can do this? Basically, we need to train the system. How do you do it by, you know, putting a lot of subgraphs and super graphs. A super graph, again, in a big company, they have a lot. That could be an interesting thing. Um, AI can identify the pattern and basically uh, merge those, those one. Uh, why do we want to do this? Honestly, because it's a complex problem. And we're always trying to make it better, and we're making it better, and making it better. But honestly, it's too complex. There is going to be always an obs ob uh, obstacle. And again, I think that we can do it. This is a roadmap of how to do this, right? Which I think is very, very interesting. OK, so again, what is then is our system. We have a subgraph, putting it in the function, getting the supergraph. Again, pretty s it's not that simple, but you know, that is the training one. So that's num case number, case two. And we'll go to case three, but I think I'm over time, so we'll go very quick. It's optimistic of a pre-query. Usually when, brow when people are querying something, let's say they, they, they're looking at the browser, they're moving fast, we can predict the actually next query. I think with, with that, we can actually be very smart about figure out what will be the next query and therefore go and make so that we optimize our server for that. So again, very... I'm not going to go, I don't have time. I think I'm all over time, right? I'm over time, so, <laughs> so I will go fast. But what I'm trying to say here is that that's actually something that can improve performance. It can help us with a lot. I will give that slide later so everybody can read it in detail. But again, what are we getting? We basically going to give query and get the next query. And then we will be able to actually make the server. Last but not least, and then I'm done, um, is you know, always in GraphQL, if you, in AI, if you're looking at where we can actually Leverage it is an outreach a, a prediction or anomaly detection. This is something that in every space, honestly, so in GraphQL as well, again, we can actually look at the access log and figure out, get a correlation of a field that is joined between a lot of, of, of query and causing to an outrage. We can see some pattern of queries that together are creating the outrage and basically, again, try to prevent that. So again, I will give my slide because unfortunately I'm out of time. But again, what is the... Information here, you're getting a query, and eventually, you know, if there is an outreach or not, we can prevent that. So again, 
This is the fourth thing that I thought about it. I think there is way more, and I do think that AI will change our market. I think that you know it will eliminate jobs, it will create a new one, and I can't wait to see what it's going to do for us. Um, we are solo. We have a booth. If you want to talk about it more, I'm here until my flight. And thank you so much. <laughs>